My name is Uri. I come from a company called Sky. Um, I'll give you kind of the formal spiel. So Sky is the only full go-to-market engine that enables smarter decisions and better outcomes. Um, our platform includes a, a suite of uh, data-driven products uh, for market intelligence, omnichannel media activation, testing and measurement. Um, within that kind of broader context, I'm a data science team lead, and I'm going to discuss a little bit how we tackled an issue that we're calling uh, conversion latency. Uh, before we dive into the problem, just to kind of uh, introduce the team. So, uh, like I said, I'm a data science team lead, a, a team of four, and on this project, uh, three team members worked on it, uh, Jero, Ayal, and Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is even here. Um, we're part of uh, a wider uh, optimization and insights group that's uh, uh, being managed gracefully by, by Amit Yulis, who's also uh, joined us. Um, uh, within the responsibilities of the team, so we, um, we're responsible for most of the optimization uh, tools in Sky. Um, that covers um, most of the digital marketing uh, management in Sky in terms of optimization. So we're talking bids budgets, um, forecasting, um, long-term kind of uh, planning for digital marketing. Um, all our products are in production. They, they meet a lot of clients. A lot of money is passing through our tools. And uh, just to kind of give a little background on performance marketing and uh, basically how we measure uh, the quality or the efficiency of the campaign in, in the pay-per-click setting. So an advertiser pays for the clicks he gets on his ad, he pays the publisher. In our scenario, we're talking about Amazon as the publisher. Um, and in order to measure the efficiency of the campaign, we're looking at the ratio between the revenue that uh, the advertiser gets on his purchases, uh, divided by the cost of the advertising itself. Like I said, the cost goes um, is, is uh, counted based on the clicks. Um, so this ratio, uh, return on ad spend, ROAS, ROI, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. Um, in order to measure this, this ROAS, this ratio, we basically need to identify the sale or the conversion. Uh, when, when we call it a conversion, the, the meaning is when a click turns into an actual purchase. So the name is conversion. Um, so we need to identify these conversions, match them to the relevant click, and that way we can uh, calculate the, the campaign efficiency. So why is there even an issue here? Well, this is kind of a classical example. Uh, a, a potential buyer, he searches on, he or she searches on Amazon, uh, they click on an ad, but they don't make the purchase immediately. Because it's Sunday, I don't know, beginning of the week. They need time to, to think, to, to browse, to compare to other products. And only on Friday, they actually make the purchase. But at the point of the purchase, we're actually updating the conversion count uh, for Sunday. So the, the, you can think of this process as kind of a travel back in time. Um, so. In that way, we can actually say, okay, the efficiency of the campaign is, is based on, on, on these uh, data points and, and, and get the notion of, of uh, how efficient the campaign is. But during this time frame, where the buyer is deliberating, comparing, uh, the advertiser still needs to make decisions on his ad campaign. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, will you please explain what is the click? Sorry? Click. Click? Yeah. Click on an ad. So I see an ad in Amazon and I click on it and that is registered. And at that point, the advertiser is paying Amazon money for that click. And uh, so we need to kind of uh, keep count of the clicks and we need to keep count of the conversions in order to be able to, to say how efficient the campaign is. Did that cover the, the question? Yeah. What data you keep on the clicks? Sorry? What data do you keep on, every, on each click? Well, a lot of data, a lot of metadata. It kind of depends on uh, how the click is uh, registered. 
So uh, in this in, in this scenario in Amazon, we're kind of dependent on the, the information that Amazon shares on the click. But there are instances, for instance, in, in, in search or in Facebook, uh, which we also uh, deal with, where uh, we basically own the cookie and the metadata that comes with it. So it kind of depends on the channel. Um, but uh, the, the point I wanted to make is that during this kind of deliberation time, the advertiser needs to make changes to his advertising activity. He needs to decide if he wants to stop it, activate more, increase budgets, reduce bids. But he doesn't have a, a good uh, notion of how efficient his, his campaign is and he needs, but, and how to make the decision of where to invest uh, his money, his advertising uh, money. So again, I'm reiterating the point of making decisions based on partial data. And this, this time frame where the, the buyer is, is thinking about buying is what we call the conversion latency. Now, for, for technical reasons of how uh, the conversion is attributed to the click, there is a kind of window of 14 days, what we call, we used to call the cookie window, but essentially the click window you can, or the attribution window. Um, and during these 14 days, we want to make a prediction on what the final value of uh, conversions and revenue will be uh, for that given uh, historical date or historical clicks. As I just mentioned, the goal is to predict the final attributed a revenue and conversion count while buyers are still browsing. Uh, and we do two, we want to do two things with that. One is show it to the user, the advertiser, so we can make better decisions. But uh, also we, as we manage optimization tools, we want to feed that information into optimization and make better decisions uh, as fast as we can. Okay. So if we, if we come to formulate this problem, so naturally it feels like a time series issue or time series problem or time series prediction problem, but it's not a typical one for, for several reasons. One, for the most part, this process is an accumulation process. So we start with a low number of conversions on Sunday and as time progresses, the numbers rise. It's mostly an accumulation process because Amazon does have a, a return uh, mechanism where you can return uh, uh, purchases you've made, uh, data corrections, etc. Another thing that kind of is kind of different from uh, time series prediction typically is it, it's a, it's a short time series. So the maximum length is what we call the attribution window, the 14 days. But uh, we also want to make predictions two days after the click. So the time series for prediction is just two time time steps long. Again, not a typical time series issue. Um, of course, since like I mentioned, it's an accumulation process, so there's no kind of autocorrelation or seasonality within the observation of the time series. Um, and again, we want to make a prediction uh, one or two days after the click already. So uh, on a single prediction day, the model needs to predict for yesterday, the day before yesterday, and so on, 14 days back. So essentially, we get a multi-horizon prediction issue or problem. So the model needs to handle predictions where the ob uh, observation that it's uh, predicting on can be anywhere from one to 13 time steps long. Okay, so we formulated the problem. Uh, this is kind of how we try to solve it. Uh, first of all, where do we get the data? Um, since we have a data table that is synchronized with Amazon every day, um, sometimes even several times a day, uh, like I said, we want to go back in time and see what was the value in the table uh, 13 days ago and 12 days ago, etc. So Snowflake, which is our data lake uh, uh, software, I guess, or solution, has a feature that's uh, neatly called time travel, where you can query the table and ask what was the values in the table for a specific time step. So when we come to build our training data for the model, uh, we essentially want to collect many of these examples of a snapshot of a time series of snapshots. So the query, although it becomes quite uh, ugly, uh, it does the trick and it allows us to, to collect these, uh, these time series uh, of updates uh, for the historical uh, prediction, historical performance. Day. So I mentioned the, the time series component. And this is kind of a schematic view of, of uh, the model architecture that we, we were using here. And 
I started with, with the time series component. So uh, it's essentially, it's uh, eventually fed into a, a recurrent uh, a neural network stack, uh, for, for example, an STM in, in our case. Um, but before we actually fit it in the, into a, a recurrent uh, stack, we need to simulate the situation in, in production, in serving, while training. So we do that by actually taking the full time series and masking it. So, uh, yeah, I see people are nodding, so it makes sense. Um, we take each observation we have in the training set. Uh, we choose uh, three random masks and we mask them. And, and in that way, we get the, the training data uh, for the model. Yeah. Each click, what are the information you are collecting? So, th there is quite a lot of information that are, is collected through clicks, uh, but... Uh, if you collect more data, you have a more uh, memory, you know, and how you uh, analyze it? Okay, so essentially we're looking at aggregated daily data. We're not interested in a single click, or what happens for a single buyer. Uh, we're trying to look at if we take all the clicks of a certain day in aggregation and the partial conversions that we already have for that day, and we try to predict the final conversions for that day, for that uh, campaign. Uh, sorry? Is it, is it average? Is it? Sorry? Average. average. Is it the average of that uh, information of that day? No, it's, it's, the, it's the values I have now for that, for that day. But it's an aggregation over the entire day. So I'm not looking at single event data. I'm looking at an aggregation, a daily aggregation. Um, we're also switching uh, to hourly, not in this project, but hourly data is also obviously interesting in this, in this uh, context. So, uh, but, but currently we're talking daily data. Uh, daily data. So hourly, how hourly is back this one, your result? Well, I have a feeling that uh, if, if we switch to hourly, the granularity itself will, will provide more information in terms of how the time series behaves uh, with, the, with the updates. So uh, now all, all I see is a single update per day, while if I see several updates to, per day, that's more information, and hopefully that will give better predictions. But it's not something we, we tested out yet, but it, it, it feels the right direction. We talked about the time series component, and the output of is concatenated with two more components. Uh, the first of which is what we call the campaign name uh, embedding or a campaign name model. Um, it's based on uh, the FastText library. We're training a, a custom model uh, on, on our data. And just to kind of give a taste of what the data looks like, so these are uh, typical examples of what a campaign name might be. Uh, it's built of characters, but I wouldn't call it like a, a language one can read and really understand too much from. There are, of course, uh, uh, general abbreviations, maybe product and uh, brand names are, are part of the, of the text, but there are also a lot of client-specific naming conventions, uh, abbreviations that they use internally and are not necessarily cross-client. Cross and uh, uh, of course, we also have a, a marketing activity across all Amazon marketplaces and regions. So it's also multilingual. So uh, these are just examples in English, but we have uh, uh, as many languages as Amazon has regions or, or marketplaces. So kind of these examples and these, these uh, properties of the campaign name led us to, to, to the feeling that we need to train a custom model uh, because it's not something that a model trained on, on Wikipedia or on Twitter would, would really be that helpful. Um, another thing that uh, FastText was kind of uh, nice to have in that sense is uh, the fact that the representation in FastText is, is character-based uh, or character engrams. Uh, so each character seen in the training data is part of the vocabulary, as well as engrams, so combinations or typical combinations of characters in the data, so the abbreviations and stuff like that. We, we, we expect FastText in this context to catch them. Um, also, the fact that it's character-based, so we get the multilingual out of the box. Uh, so that also covers uh, this issue. And again, the fact that it's character-based gives 
the inductiveness so we can create a repre a embedding representation, vector representations for campaigns that we're not seeing during training. Uh, so that kind of widens the scope, so we can also give predictions for new campaigns that were just newly created, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another nice thing that Fastex uh, kind of gives us is the ability to train it supervised and give it a, an objective for training, and not just based on the context of the tokens or, uh, or, or, or anything of that sort, but in this sense, what we, the task we gave it was to predict what we call revenue per conversion at the campaign level. So it's basically the price of the product being sold by that campaign. So we're, we're inserting into or, or, or providing uh, the, the, the dense representation some notion of what the campaign is selling, or at least how, uh, uh, how expensive the product is. Uh, we have a feeling that uh, people uh, take more time when they buy when the price of the product they're buying is higher. Uh, so we expect that to have an impact on, on the latency and on the latency prediction. When looking at the, at the embedding space, once we've done uh, the embedding on the campaigns, one nice property that uh, is kind of easy to see is, is the separation between the price bins. Uh, so uh, this is the, the, the embedding space projected to 3D. Uh, the, the vectors we're building are 10 dimensional uh, and we're covering about 360,000 campaigns that actually have conversions. And it's, it's easy to see that there's a nice separation between uh, which campaign re uh, lies in which uh, price bin. Uh, so that, that kind of gives us confidence in, in that the information we, we want is in the embedding space. And uh, another thing that's also hard to see here maybe on, on the screen is that when you look at uh, campaigns that are near each other in the original embedding space, they share a lot of characters uh, as one would expect from a, from a, from a language model. So w we have uh, in a joint sense, both the proximity based on the, the actual text of the campaign, the campaign text, text of the campaign name and the price of the product being sold uh, in the campaign. Okay, um, the final component we used in the model is what we're calling campaign structure uh, embedding. And uh, it, it's also graph based, but not a graph convolutional network like was mentioned in the first talk, kind of a simpler uh, graph model. But first maybe t uh, I'll say a few words on why we even have a graph. So advertisers, if you look at their activity, you can think of it as a hierarchy. So we have the, the, the advertiser at the top. Advertiser has several profiles, and usually these profiles are matching uh, an account in Amazon. And that usually means that they have a separate currency in a separate time zone. Um, and you can see kind of three examples from three different advertisers and how they manage the campaigns. Uh, the, the left, the bottom left is kind of, is not a typical example where an advertiser put all these campaigns in one profile, but usually you'll see these kind of things where each advertiser has several profiles and each profile has uh, many campaigns. Um, in, in this uh, representation, I colored the campaigns based on the marketplace, the, the Amazon region. But in the graph representation, they're actually separate nodes. So, uh, different advertisers are connected in the graph representation through the marketplace nodes. So we expect similarity between campaigns from different advertisers to an extent if they share the same marketplace. So again, the idea is to have all this information in the embedding space. Um, so since we have different node types, this is considered a heterogeneous graph and it kind of limits, or not limits, but it helps you choose which, which uh, embedding model uh, you're going to, to work with. Um, and we chose to use this mult um, because it supports uh, multi-relations. In our context, you can think of edges between different types of nodes as different types of edges and then it can, you can consider it a multi-relation. Um, 
Uh, what this tool does is, is it's basically a, an encoder-decoder approach, and it represents um, the relation between uh, the, the node, the edge, or the relation, and uh, the, the other node. And each of these are, are a, a learned representation, so they are learned during, during training. And the, the decoder is defined as, as, a, as a dot product between the three of them, so uh, they, they kind of uh, defined a, a three-way dot product. Um, the loss function uh, is, is called margin loss or hinge loss. Uh, the idea is that it, it encourages uh, triplets that really exist in the graph to get a, a, a low score. And a part of the process is what's called negative sampling, where we take existing triplets, existing uh, source, relation, target nodes, um, and corrupt them. So, uh, for instance, we change the origin node, we change the relation type, we change the target node, and the loss function, since that triplet does not exist in the graph, penalizes it, and, and that uh, is what you know uh, causes causes the model to to uh, uh, it connects, converge. Sorry, thank you, uh, and give us kind of an embedding that uh, maintains the the structure that we want. Um, again, when we look at the the embedding space. Um, we can see, and this is colored by the Amazon region, we can see that the campaigns are grouped relatively nicely according to the region. Um, and the regions themselves are relatively separated and homogeneous. Uh, so again, it kind of gives us confidence that this information is well embedded in the, in the embedding space. Um, and if, if, I took, if I take one of the uh, previous uh, advertiser examples I showed, uh, and I look at uh, its, its specific embedding for those campaigns, again, we can see uh, that uh, in the embedding space, specific profiles are clustered together. There's nice separation between the profiles. So again, where uh, this, this structure information is, is uh, well embedded in the space and existing in the, in the vector representation. So these are some of the results. This is basically a prediction versus actual for revenue. Uh, it's colored according to the length of the time series. Um, this is from production. Uh, so this is already MIDI clients um, uh, being used both in the UI and uh, in, in, in our optimization tools. Um, just to kind of give a sense of kind of the training architecture and the moving parts. So uh, as I mentioned, the source of the data is from Snowflake, but we're working in the cloud and all the training and, and serving of the models is done through, is done on top of uh, SageMaker. So uh, we need to move the data to S3, uh, do the, the training, etc., uh, report the metrics to MLflow and uh, back to, to S3. And the artifacts are used as models in SageMaker for serving. Um, all of this orchestration is done uh, via Airflow. Uh, that, that's kind of uh, the, the, the training uh, structure or architecture of how things work here. Um, and to give kind of a, a taste of, of the scale of things we're doing, so we're currently we're covering around 170 advertisers on Sky, uh, about 185,000 campaigns every day get predictions for the last 14 days. Uh, the training is done around uh, a little less than 3 million observations for, as the training set. And in terms of the revenue we're actually predicting, it's well above $20 million every day uh, of, of revenue values that clients get as a prediction uh, for their activity. Any questions or anything? What was the reason for choosing uh, opting? Well, we're limited by, by the tracking of the conversion. So Amazon, that matching where the conversion is matched to Sunday, it can only happen in a time frame of 14 days, not longer uh, than that. So we're limited to 14 days. That's the default configuration. There are, there are, there are excuses, uh, 
uh, clients that configure it to be a longer period, but the default is 14, and that's, that's most of the cases are, are 14. How much computing power does it take you to do all this computation? Well, it's, it's trained asynchronously, so there's no real-time issue here. We're training the model once a week. Uh, the training time, I think, currently is around 12 hours. How many cores? It's not a GPU or anything. Uh, a it's 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 a SageMaker machine. Machine, I think it uh, is sixteen or, or maybe okay. more. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, it's on SageMaker. I I I, I wouldn't train this locally. It depends how much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. It, it's a price issue eventually. Uh, I wonder how you take into account uh, special dates, etc., that might interfere with. Uh, representing uh, uh, time this, uh, so special events and and that's kind of a general issue for us in sky in any digital marketing uh, if you look at uh, amazon uh, prime days or uh, i don't know black friday stuff about holidays and sunday versus weekday and so well sunday versus weekday is not is not such a big issue but things like Christmas, Prime Day, uh, Black Fridays, Cyber Mondays. Sunday. If, if, we were surprised, for instance, by President's Day recently, which kind of really th threw the model off. Uh, so we're currently kind of uh, semi-manually uh, monitoring the data that, that's fed into the model, both in the training and the serving size. About uh, whether this is an attitude, like uh, some product in some season are more likely to well, that's long-term seasonality. I, I, I agree, it, it, but it's very long-term, like it's seasonality over the year. And, and uh, the time frames we're dealing with here are very, very short. So I, I don't feel that we're really affected by long-term seasonality. Weekly seasonality might be a bit of an issue. Uh, I, I didn't mention it, but it, the day of week is also part of one of the features of the model. Um, but we haven't seen that it has that much of an impact. The model is robust. Sorry? Robust. In what sense? Like, let's say you take the uh, last the model you had a week ago to today. How much? So we uh, we haven't done th that thorough of an analysis on the model, like a uh, drift or, or stuff like that. We're still, uh, as I mentioned, semi manually monitoring the data to see that it makes sense. And we we have an example of President's Day that 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 did cause problems for us. Um, but we're we're transitioning into a more automated way of looking at the data it, it's a bit complex because we didn't find any tool that can give us like real automated statistics on the data when when we consider it as a time series or even a matrix uh, it's not that we didn't find anything really out of the box maybe we, maybe we're missing last question so last question then do you have any testing mechanism when you run? Like, let's say 50% of the traffic will be with the new model, 50% with some baseline. Okay, so b before we went with this architecture to production, we went to production with a baseline model that was based on simple averages at the campaign level. And before deploying this, we obviously compared it to the baseline and luckily we beat it pretty well. So it was, it was an easy decision to go with this, but um, the rollout to the client's UI has been GA, so all clients see, see the values we predict in the UI. But for the optimization tools, we're a bit uh, more careful, so we're releasing it uh, a bit slower than, than you know, full GA immediately. Uh, and we're monitoring the impact. So when we take a client's portion of activity and activate the latency correction on it, we, we do, we're currently doing mostly a before and after analysis. It's not that easy because clients also make changes to the activity. Um, but uh, choosing two groups of activity that are similar enough in order to do an A-B test is not that simple. I, we're well versed with A-B test in general because it's very typical in, in digital marketing to do an A-B test as an advertiser before you launch a, a marketing activity. So. We're very familiar with uh, A-B testing met methodology and, and we, we've done many A-B tests. It's very difficult to find similar enough activity uh, and to actually do a real, really good A-B test. So it's not, it's not always helpful, uh, though some clients insist in, in other uh, scenarios to do an A-B test. Thank you. Thank you.